Hello everyone this is the finale of what if Naruto was banished and goes back to Kanoa, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. It was early morning, and two days before Hareze's deadline. Naruto was already up, quickly engulfing a quick breakfast he prepared. It wasn't much, but it had plenty of what he needed for plenty of burnable energy, eggs, juice, a bowl of grain cereal, milk, and an apple he found in the refrigerator. He munched down his breakfast, turning the moments of yesterday's impromptu meeting with Sunid in his mind. It was shortly after returning to Kanoa that Naruto invited himself into the Hokage's office. Sunad looked at him, a very annoyed look. Shizun was out on duties, so she didn't have anyone to watch her office for her. Still, that didn't mean Naruto could just barge inside. What is the meaning of this Naruto? She demanded from the shinobi. Naruto, knowing that Sunad would want a quick answer for such a rude entrance, that he simply rummaged through the knapsack that still clutched to his back. He pulled out the log of Doragon and showed it to her. Sunad didn't too impressed, but after glancing at the book's impressive cover and symbol, she quickly realized his reasons. So you found the log, she said. And I can assume there's a reason you're here at this hour. Yes, he said, and decided to sit down on one of the available chairs across from Sunad. Well, out with it then Naruto. You've already barged your way in here, get to the point. The last log is held by Orokimaru, he said. The mention of the remaining Sanon caused a pained look to come over Sunad, who fell back into her chair, letting the cushioning absorb her slight distress. Naruto thought that she looked so sad, almost pitiful even. However, he then reminded himself about the jaded past of the Sanon. So you're requesting a mission to head for Otokaga, spoke Sunad. Naruto simply nodded, there was no need for words, especially when he could say something incredibly stupid. Oto is not as strong as it was since the days of it founding, it's almost like Orokimaru has made it disappear from the world stage. Still, this is a Sanon we're discussing here. How far is the village from here? Asked Naruto. About a day and a half, at least for high-level shinobi, she answered. That's no good, said Naruto, shaking his head. At best, if I was able to defeat the bastard and get out of there alive, it would still be a four-day round trip. The deadline is in two. I'm not sure about that, interjected Sunad, getting the blonde's attention. Why's that? You have one log, and Hareze is a patient sort, explained Sunad. I get the feeling also, that he's keeping an eye on your progress, in his own way. How? My best guess is just asking around town, or merchants passing by, or even having people get the information for him. Either way, if he finds that you're getting the last log, I think he'd be the type to wait it out a few more days. But do you even know him? He questioned the hockage. I mean, how well could you have gotten to know him? He left the village a long time ago, before you even became hockage probably. True, said Sunad, but a person lets on more than he thinks merely by the slightest actions they do. So far, all I hear about this man is that he's the patient, strategic sort. I bet right now he's considering the situation and plotting out his best move. Maybe, muttered Naruto, still skeptical about Sunid's idea. Anyways, you have something else to worry about, she said, getting the boy back on track. You need to get ready for a very dangerous expedition. With the way things are, I can allow you three other shinobi to assist you. I know exactly who I want then, said Naruto. Good, send in the proper paperwork, and I'll make sure it's approved. Now I suggest you get some rest, you're going to need it. Naruto nodded, and got up out of his chair. He proceeded towards the door, but Sunad stopped him momentarily. Naruto. Yes, Sunad Sama. Asked Naruto. Come back alive, she started. Naruto didn't turn his head. He didn't tear up, nor did he smile brightly at the hockage. He simply waved his hand signaling he heard Sunid's request, and went on his way. Naruto had finished his breakfast, and quickly put his dishes away, letting them soak in the sink until he could get back. He headed for the living room, and approached Tezumateki, which was sleeping soundly against the wall. Hope you're ready for a fight, old friend, Naruto spoke to the axe, 
almost as if he expected an answer. He picked it up, and latched it onto his back. He then heard a knock at his door. Naruto speedily answered the door, and there stood Sakura, Sasuke, and Tenten, in their shinobi gear. Ready Naruto? asked Sasuke. Of course, he said with a smile, but then got serious for a moment. You know, I picked you three for a reason, you're the three most precious people to me. Still, this is going to be extremely dangerous. If you want to back out now, I'd understand. The three friends looked at each other, and then back at Naruto. They were silent for quite a while, and Naruto was expecting the worse. That is, until Tenten came up and slapped him on the backside. He yelped a bit in surprise. Come on Naru, she said smiling. Sasuke's supposed to be the serious one here. If you get all mopey on us, then this is going to be a long trip. She's right Naruto, commented Sakura, it doesn't matter what is before us, we're going to do this with you. That's what friends and loved ones do for each other. Lighten up Naruto, said Sasuke. It's your nature to be the one who always keeps people's spirits up, and we're going to need plenty of that for this mission. This certainly loosened up Naruto, as he began to get to be more like his usual self. He closed the door behind him, and locked it. Well then, let's go snake hunting, he said. The party of four quickly made their way towards the remnants of what was the village of Otokaga. They found themselves in the middle of a deep forest. From the best they could tell, Naruto, Sasuke, Sakura, and Tenten were somewhere off the borders of the country of wind and the smaller and less prestigious flower country. It certainly would be a tactically sound place to form a village, as the forest was plentiful deep and complex. In addition, as the four transversed their way through it, they noticed something very strange. No sound at all emitted from the large forest. One would think to hear the chirping of birds, the rummaging of squirrels, and splashing of fish from a nearby stream. None of the preceding noises were being made at all. Naruto, looking every which way, could hear the crumbling of dirt underneath the soles of his shoes. Tenten heard the tiny drop of sweat on her forehead roll off, and explode on the ground. Sakura could hear the sound of her eyelashes blinking together. Sasuke felt his quiet shinobi heartbeat, so accurately he could count the precise number of beats per minute. It was after a few hours of carefully navigating the forest floors that they came across a slight clearing, which stuck out like a bald spot in the middle of a lush forest. It wasn't too big, maybe at most one mile in circumference, with with the inside was bare of any debris of any kind. Near the middle, a small, grey stone hill protruded from the ground. Upon closer look, there was a large hole in the hill, large enough for people to enter from. Looks like this is Otokaga, said Tenten, surveying the area in case of ambush. This piss ant bunker, exclaimed Naruto. He probably carved the village underground Naruto, suggested Sasuke. Why the heck would he do that? Naruto asked his male friend. It's probably easier to kill any intruders, commented Sakura. And sound doesn't travel as well through solid ground, so he could easily sneak attack anyone who would come looking. How deep could that thing go? Asked Tenten. As deep as Orokimaru wants it to, interjected Naruto. No time for debating the purpose guys, let's get in there, and do what we came her for. The four, one by one, entered the tunnel. They were greeted by pitch black for a mile, before they saw the faint lighting of torches adorning the cavern walls. The tunnel was made of solid granite, and in each large wall slab was a medium-sized porthole. They were most likely there so that air from the surface could travel into the tunnels. The four took a square formation, and kept in synchronization as they sprinted down the long tunnel. There are no traps in this tunnel, mentioned Sasuke. You think he's the type of ego to not use them? Asked Tenten. No, he just wants to lead us on, thought Naruto. Get our confidence up, then crush us. You think anyone is capable of being that sick? Questioned Sakura. If anyone is, it's this bastard, said Naruto. After what Jiraiya and Sunid told me about this guy, he's as demented as they come. It was after a few more miles of tunnel that they came across a large room containing a two-way junction, which branched out in opposite directions. They were separated by an ornately decorated stone wall. Peering down each tunnel showed little information as to which way was the right path. What now? asked Sakura. Care to flip a coin? remarked Naruto. I think we'll need something more reliable than that, commented Tenten. The four experienced shinobi then tensed up slightly, as they heard a noise. 
It was hard to tell where it was coming from, as the walls seemed to be very capable of echoing sounds. However, from best they could tell, it sounded like some kind of engine or motor. The decorated wall slab soon exploded into multiple pieces of rubble. Through the kicked up clouds of dirt, smoke and rubble, came a blurry whirlwind. Naruto and the gang jumped away, as the mini tornado spinned chaotically, with no sense of direction. After a few dozen rotations, the whirlwind started to die down, and in the eye of the storm was a massive figure. It was a humanoid figure, that much they could make out from the fact the creature stood on two feet, and had two arms. However, those two arms were both on the same side. The other side of the creature's torso was leaning towards the ground, as it was weighted down more than the opposite side. The arm on the leaning side could almost be considered something besides an arm. It was at least twice as long as the other two arms put together. And it was thick too, about as round and wide a column found on only the largest temple grounds. Attached to the giant pillar arm was a motor, which must have been the sound they heard before. The monster's hair was long, thick, and unkempt. So much of his white hair was emerging from his head, that it completely covered his face. Its skin was a light, sickly green in color, and there were many visible scars, scabs, veins, and muscles adorning the entire body. Run, suggested Sakura. Scatter, shouted Naruto, and the four did just that. Sakura ran into one of the branching tunnels, and Naruto went through the other. However, the monster man was quicker in initiative than his figure let on. The loud hum of the motor on his arm started up, and soon the monster was rushing the two tunnels. Sasuke and Tenten, having been at the back of the formation, still had to make it to the tunnels. It was too late, as the monster ripped through the surrounding structure, causing the two tunnels to cave in. Naruto heard the collapsing walls behind him, and ran into the rubble as deep as he could. Sasuke, Tenten, he shouted, trying to pierce the solid rock. He stayed motionless for a few moments, as he could hear the sounds of battle on the other side. Naruto, go, shouted Sasuke's voice. We'll be fine, get moving. After a sigh of relief, Naruto decided that his friend had the right idea. You better beat that freak you too. He shouted, and then ran back through the tunnel's depths. Beat this thing. Easier said than done, said Tenten. One hit from that tornado attack, and we'll be toast. Flank him Tenten-chan, said Sasuke, who ran one side of the monster. Tenten followed suit on the opposite side. They both had the same idea, and threw a barrage of shuriken into the beast. The monster didn't move, almost as if he didn't even see the attack coming. Five kunai sunk into his flesh from one side, and six more from the other side. The blood from the freakish behemoth dripped down his arms, before landing on the floor, to which it began to eat through the solid stone. An acidic blood, perfect, said Sasuke. What else does this freak have to show us? Let's see, said Tenten, as she let loose one of the scrolls from her bracelets. She unfurled it, and leapt into the air before making the necessary seals. Try this, she taunted, as the scroll released the seals placed on it, and a shower of weapons headed for the beast. It simply turned its head at Tenten's direction, before coughing up something in his throat, and spitting it out towards Tenten. The spitwood melted most of the weapons instantly, and the remaining droplets connected with her on the upper arms, stomach, and lover legs. Tenten yelped in pain at the burning sensation, and quickly ripped off the covered parts of her garb to stop it from eating through her skin. Sasuke, using the monster's momentarily lack of attention, tried to attack its backside. The creature's motor arm quickly started up, and backhanded the Uchiha, the tremendous force sending Sasuke into the wall, where he made a decent-sized crater. Sasuke coughed up a large gob of blood from the blow, and shook his head as he tried to get his vision to stop blurring. The monster seemed to be coming for him, dragging his large arm across the ground as he did so. It was stopped momentarily, as it felt the sensation of several dozen weapons digging into its flesh from the back. It turned its head to see Tenten, panting with her unfurled scroll in her left hand. The behemoth's entire back was embedded with kunai, swords, knives, sickles, karma, and several different types of shuriken. The beast was halted from his assault on Sasuke, so the jonin took the time to prepare a technique he picked up a long time ago. He started forming the kata, albeit slowly as he was still staggered from the massive blow. Meanwhile, the creature started to flex, as veins popped up all over the its massive body. 
Some of the less embedded weapons, like the Kama and Sickles, slowly were pushed out, and they dropped to the ground. The Shuriken and knives, however, soon shot out with a lot of force, and went straight for Tenton. Tenton dodged the attack, as the weapons either sunk into the stone wall, or bounced off of it onto the ground. Chidori, shouted Sasuke, and charged the beast. The bright chakra mass in his hand crackled with fierce intensity, as so did Sasuke's Sharingan eyes. The beast started up its motor arm again, and prepared to punch Sasuke with enough force to dismember him. Sasuke was within attacking distance, and the monster threw a massive punch. However, the Sharingan allowed Sasuke to easily sidestep the blow, and he drove his fist into the monster's belly. The blow staggered the beast, as his massive arm went limp. Sasuke wasn't done yet though, and lifted his fist in an uppercut, cutting the beast in half from the waist up. The creature's blood started to spray wildly, with Sasuke and Tenten retreating to a safe distance to dodge any of the acidic blood. As their blood began to cool off, and their heartbeats began to relax, Tenten and Sasuke took in a well-deserved breath before assessing their situation. You okay Sasuke-kun? asked Tenten. Sasuke tried to get up, but winced in pain as he did so. I've definitely got broken ribs and internal injury, but I'll live, replied Sasuke. How about you? I'm surprised you're not missing a few limbs. I got lucky, she said. That acid tore through my overshirt, undershirt, chainmail, padding, and then it barely touched my skin before it was gone. I'll need to get the burns treated though. So what now? asked Tenton. I don't think we can get through that rubble, Sasuke thought aloud. And even if somehow we did manage to clear a path, we wouldn't be any help in our condition. Should we try to find another path? That's probably the best thing to do at the moment. Besides, Sakura and Naruto can more than handle themselves. I hope you're right, said Tenten, as she offered Sasuke her shoulder to lean onto. Sasuke obliged her, and the two started to backtrack their way out of the tunnel. Meanwhile, Sakura had been running for a good half hour, if not an entire one. Still, the tunnel never faltered from being a straight line. The Kunoiki pondered why would a legendary ninja make such a simple fortification to live in. Even if this Orokimaru was a notorious trickster, even he would try to stray from such blatant mediocrity. Her analysis on the Sanon would have to wait however, as Sakura saw the end of the tunnel ahead. It stopped with a large wall, with a single door providing entry. Being careful, Sakura slowly opened the door, her eyes memorizing every inch of detail from the crack before opening the door more. She then found herself in a pitch black room, so much so that Sakura couldn't see even five feet in front of her. She felt around the wall, and eventually found a large power switch, to which she promptly flipped on. She was greeted with a ghastly sight. As the lights above her on catwalks turned on, she noticed she had found an extremely large chamber. However, the most shocking part were the seemingly endless rows of large incubation tanks. Each one contained something, but Sakura noticed that all of them could be classified as one thing. Human remains. Some tanks held a whole cadaver, others only human torsos. Others had internal organs, while others contained whole limbs. Some only had a few scant human remains. What the hell is this? exclaimed the shocked girl, as she walked her way through the middle of the forest of tubes. The the remnants of what was the shinobi army of Oto, spoke a voice, Sakura turned to catch the eyes of its owner. He was a very timid looking person, one would suspect at first glance. His garb was simple purple and white, with a blue obi sash around his waist. His hair was white, which was weird considering he didn't look a day over 30 years old. He also wore glasses, and had a nervous habit of constantly adjusting them. The remnants of Oto, what do you mean? asked Sakura. Lord Orokimaru founded this village with a very specific purpose in mind. Sure, he like any great village, needed many talented shinobi to help him build this village. However, once the job was done, he only needed one thing. And that is, test subjects, said the man, smiling to himself. People to help him gain the knowledge he has fought to find his entire life. Of course, he knew many would decline being living experiments, but dead cadavers you can reanimate work just as well. And who are you, some sick follower of his? My name is Kabuto, replied the man, and I am the one who will kill you. Sakura felt his killing intent skyrocket, and quickly moved her head, as she felt something whiz past her, and hit the door behind her with a loud clanking noise. 
Sakura saw Kabuto run away from her, towards the opposite end of the chamber. Sakura pursued, and soon found another doorway. Being cautious, instead of opening the door normally, she focused her chakra and punched the door, taking a good chunk of the wall along with it. She eyed the chamber she just unceremoniously entered. It seemed about the same size as the previous one, except it was already illuminated with light. Also, there were no incubation tubes. Sakura made her way near the center of the room, when she felt the presence of her enemy. Kabuto tried to strike at her from behind, but the kunoiki pulled out a kunai and blocked the incoming weapon. As she clashed with Kabuto, Sakura noticed what he was holding, a scalpel. So, you're a medical shinobi, said Sakura, as she found herself actually struggling to keep Kabuto at bay. And so are you, he replied. How else would you know how to punch through solid walls? Sunad Sama trained me well, she answered. Ah, that explains it, said Kabuto with a grin. In that case, this should be interesting. Kabuto jumped back, and threw a volley of scalpels towards Sakura, who dodged the basic attack easily by jumping into the air. Kabuto let loose another volley quickly, and this time connected with Sakura, who dissipated into smoke from contact. Kabuto just smirked at the substitution, and jumped back a ways as Sakura came crashing down from above him, creating a large crater in the middle of the chamber. Were you trying to do this? He spoke into Sakura's ear, as he shadowed her back. Sakura turned to defend herself, but Kabuto quickly focused Chakra into his fist, and connected with the kunoiki in the gut, sending her flying into the wall behind her. Brutality won't get me through this one, thought Sakura, as she recovered from the blow. So if I can't beat him as a regular shinobi, let's try beating him like a medical shinobi. The gears in Sakura's head started to turn, as she reached into one of her pouches, and fished out a large bundle of wire. However, she momentarily forgot that Kabuto was still on the offensive, and quickly dodged as Kabuto landed a death blow into the wall, creating large cracks that ran along its entirety. Come out wherever you are, he said playfully, overwhelmed with ego as he had the advantage. He threw another scalpel at Sakura, who took it before dissipating into smoke. Sakura meanwhile, was running around the chamber seemingly randomly. She would stop for a moment, before creating a substitute just in time before she met the sting of a scalpel. Wash, rinse, repeat. Despite having fun hunting Sakura down like some petty animal, Kabuto soon grew bored with just distance attacks. He decided to close the distance, and intercepted Sakura near the middle of the chamber. He tried to punch her again, with another chakra-focused punch, but Sakura dodged it easily. The two began exchanging blows in the center. Unlike regular fighting, both were medical shinobi using chakra-enhanced punches and kicks, so even the most glancing blow could prove to be damaging. Therefore, the two opponents were partaking in a sort of wild dance, as they would attack, then dodge the other's attack. However, Sakura made a mistake, given that her specialty wasn't to jitsu. Kabuto tried to trip her by sweeping at her right foot, to which she simply rose her foot out of the way of the attack. When she returned her right foot to the ground, she landed awkwardly on it, giving Kabuto the splinter of an opening he needed. Kabuto backhanded Sakura's right hand, furthering her imbalance, before going at her with a straight right fist. Sakura, in her imbalance, could only bring up her left arm to block the blow. The punch landed directly on the forearm, breaking it instantly. Sakura was also pushed back a ways by the sheer force behind the blow. Sakura bit her lip hard, as she tried to endure the pain of her now shattered forearm. Give up. Kabuto taunted the girl. Sakura simply smirked at him. You men are so easily manipulated, she said, before tugging at the wire in her still working right hand. Kabuto suddenly felt his body under intense pressure, as he looked down to see he was wrapped tightly in a web of wire. You. He struggled to say, as he tired his best to break the wire. Why won't this damn wire break? Because I've been channeling chakra into it as we speak, said Sakura calmly as she approached the bound man. You won't be breaking it any time soon, as I can pump a lot of chakra into it. You planned this all along, said Kabuto, still trying to struggle. You thought I was just running around to dodge your attacks. She scoffed at him. I may not be the best shinobi in the world, but I'm certainly not stupid. And now for the finishing touch. Sakura took out a scalpel from one of her pouches, and looked over Kabuto's exposed chest. After analyzing it for a few minutes, she plunged the scalper into his chest, causing him to wince in pain. 
That's it. He asked. It hurt for a minute, but now I don't feel a thing. You're not supposed to, she explained. You know that the human heart is made of four chambers, right? What's that got to do with anything? He asked. Simple, she said, poking at the scalper handle poking out of his chest. I placed the blade at the exact center of the heart. That's the spot where all the muscle tissue connects to separate the chambers. Kabuto thought on that for a minute, as he ran the information he had on the heart through his head. He was in thought for a good five minutes before his eyes widened, and an angry scowl overcame his face. You, he shouted. Careful, taunted Sakura. If you increase your heartbeat too much, the scalpel will just continue to tear at your heart muscle until, she snapped her fingers, your heart ruptures, and you will bleed out instantly. Of course, you could always just try to break out of the wire, but you'll end up missing a few limbs in the process, and you'll probably bleed out anyways. Kabuto gritted his teeth, as his face showed an internal battle being waged in his head. His outlook wasn't looking too good, his choices were either to die, or die. You should feel lucky Kabuto, said Sakura, as she started to walk her way out of the chamber. Not many people get to choose how they die. Maybe if we met under different circumstances, we could have been allies. She made her way out of the chamber, closing the door behind her firmly. She then began looking for a route back to the others. Naruto had come across a smaller tunnel on his end of the caved-in junction, and quickly found a doorway. After checking out the entrance, he opened the door to find an expansive study. It was well maintained, despite being in such an environment that easily developed mold and dust. The bookshelves were the dominant pieces of the room, and were made with large planks of mahogany wood. Between each shelf were books as far as the eye can see, so much so that not one open space could be found on them. Naruto took one of the books off its perch, and skimmed the insides of it. It was a book on the history of techniques for a village Naruto had never even heard of before. He checked the circa date on the front cover, and the book appeared to be written over 100 years ago. Who could ever read so many tomes? He asked himself. That would be me, little boy, spoke a stuffed, whispered voice. Naruto closed the book, calmly put it back on the bookshelf, and turned slowly to his guest. He was thin, almost so much that you could see the bones poking out from under his skin. His skin was a pale blue, and looked dry like a desert. He had jet black hair, which partly covered his slitted eyes. His garb was pale yellow with black, complete with a large sumo rope tied round his waist. Are you Orokimaru? Asked Naruto. You've heard of me? Asked the snake charmer. Jiraiya told me about you, mentioned Naruto. Orokimaru quietly cackled to himself at that. It's so good to hear that my dear, old friend is still alive and kicking, he said gleefully. What did he tell you about me? Just that you're the most diabolical excuse for a human being ever born into this world, said Naruto, not raising his voice a single tone. That's not very nice to say to someone you just met, said the man, in a sad, hurt, tone of voice. I only did what I had to so that I could achieve my dreams. What does someone like you dream about? Said Naruto, quirking a brow at this character in front of him. My goal is simple, to learn every technique ever created. That includes present, past, and future techniques. But you could never do that, you'd have to be immortal, interrupted Orokimaru. I am quite immortal, but thank you for your concern. How in the hell? Asked Naruto. Just a kinjutsu I learned before those buffoons in Kanoa exiled me, explained the Sanan. It allows me to transfer my soul into a new body as many times as I wish. So long as I live, I will be a presence on this earth. Until someone kills you, exclaimed Naruto. And you think you will be the one to do so? Chuckled Orokimaru. My boy, I'm not just your run-of-the-mill shinobi. As a Sanan I'm quite capable of killing anyone I chose, when I chose. Then let's see what you can do. Said Naruto, and threw a large volley of shuriken and kunai at the Sanan. The snake man simply blurred out of focus, and appeared behind Naruto. Missed me, said Orokimaru in a joking tone. He stuck a kunai into Naruto's back, which caused him to dissipate into smoke. Orokimaru didn't seem troubled in the slightest at this reaction. Off to run and hide, eh? Asked Orokimaru to himself, as he began to slowly walk amongst the bookshelves in search of his prey. Well, there is one way to find you. Orokimaru started to make numerous kata at a blazing speed. His blur if kata ended with, 
Fittingly, the serpent. Suchidan, Rando Nami heavy, he said, as he slammed both his open palms onto the ground beneath him. The ground started to rise, in ripples that looked like the bodies of snakes. They grew in size until they started to topple the numerous bookshelves over, creaking a long chain of falling shelves. Their impact kicked up many clouds of dust and smoke. When the dust settled, Orokimaru scanned the room for the boy, but couldn't find him yet. The boy was pretty good at concealing himself. He then caught the presence of Naruto, a smirk appearing on his face. From out of nowhere, Tezumateki came flying out from the surrounding darkness, and sunk itself into the ground just beside the foot of the Sanon. Orokimaru didn't budge in the slightest, as Naruto came emerging out from behind his axe. Naruto threw a punch, to which Orokimaru caught, and then threw Naruto to the ground with authority. Naruto winced in pain, as he got up to find Orokimaru at a distance, creating kata at amazing speeds. Katen, Gokaku no Jitsu, he said, as he spewed a giant wave of fire from his mouth. It was coming towards Naruto at an incredible speed, to which Naruto held his arms up in defense. The fireball connected, and exploded on impact, sending embers and ash every which way. When the smoke and fire died down, Orokimaru grinned happily as he saw Naruto on his knee, the front of his arms burned, along with his face. However, he was fine and able to continue with the fight. I'm impressed, he said to Naruto. I assumed that only the Hyuga family could ever have enough control of their tenkutsu as to expunge chakra from any part of their body. And yet you just proved me wrong. A lesser shinobi would have been melted to the bone marrow. Naruto just picked himself up onto his feet, and walked over to Tezumateki, which Orokimaru surprisingly let him do so. Why are you here in the first place boy? asked Orokimaru. I'm looking for a book, answered Naruto. Well, you definitely came to the right place, said Orokimaru. But surely you would be smart enough to have a specific book in mind when you came here. The book of the Watanabe, said Naruto. Orokimaru cackled at that remark. Oh, you are a special sort indeed boy. You would come all this way for my most valued possession. You got a point, spat Naruto. Orokimaru simply pulled out a book from his back pouch. I always keep it on my person, seeing as so many people would want it, he explained. Then he took the book to his mouth, before unhinging his jaw and swallowing it whole. Naruto gave a grunt of disgust as he watched the freakish display. Now if you want it, you definitely will have to kill me, said Orokimaru. Now, how about we get set for round two? Round two. Since you're using a weapon, it's only right that I answer the challenge, said Orokimaru, as he began to regurgitate a sword, pulling it out of his throat by the handle. The sword was a masterpiece of craftsmanship. The handle was shining brilliantly of gold, and was in the shape of a dragon's neck and head, the blade being belched out of the mouth. The blade was that of a ken blade, which was a straight, double-edged blade with a point. The blade itself glowed faintly with a sky blue. Amanomarakamo, said Naruto. You've heard of it, said Orokimaru. Jiraiya let me in on it, never thought you would use it for little old me though. Well then this should make you feel like the luckiest boy in the world, said Orokimaru, as he charged Naruto. Naruto went on the defensive, as Orokimaru started to slash his way through him. With each strike Naruto blocked, it seemed as if the blade glowed more intensely. Orokimaru tried to trip Naruto with a sweep, but Naruto jumped it and maintained his defense style, but not before trying to chop Orokimaru in half with a vertical swing. Orokimaru backed up to dodge, then continued with his attack. Finally, Naruto found an opening to counter his attack. He used the end of Tezumateki's handle, and smacked the hand of Orokimaru, causing him to momentarily loosen his grip. Naruto took this moment to slice through Orokimaru, cutting him in two with a horizontal slice. However, the Orokimaru in front of him disappeared into smoke, and Naruto returned to his defense. He peered all around him, trying to sense his opponent. He suddenly felt a presence approaching him fast. He held Tezumateki in defense, as he managed to block a strike from Orokimaru. In an instant, Orokimaru concealed himself again, before trying to attack Naruto once more. Naruto was fighting frozen in place. He was a master of defensive styles, but even he knew that he couldn't stay in one spot for too long. He quickly made the cross kata. Cage bush and no jitsu, he said, as he made a dozen shadows. They spread out evenly around each other, and started to scan for Orokimaru. 
The snake Sanon quickly countered however, as he sped through the shadows like a bullet. He striked swiftly, as he took out each shadow with a single strike. One by one, the shadows were destroyed, and Naruto found himself alone once again. It's over, said Orokimaru, as he charged Naruto faster than before. Naruto tried to dodge the blow, but the sword managed to graze him across the belly. Naruto clenched his stomach in pain. Even the slightest touch feels like a mortal wound, said Orokimaru, as he walked over to his defeated prey. You did put up a decent fight though, perhaps I should spare you for experimentation. I'll never be your little guinea pig, shouted Naruto. Very well, said Orokimaru, as he thrust his sword into the heart of Naruto. Naruto's eyes went wide, before slowly closing into eternal sleep. Then Orokimaru felt his body being dragged into the ground beneath him. He suddenly found himself neck deep in the solid stone floor below him. The Naruto he slayed dissipated into smoke. A grinning Naruto emerged from behind the smoke. I win, said Naruto. Did you forget boy? I still have the book, said Orokimaru. Naruto tapped his chin in thought at that. You're right, said Naruto, before smashing the head of the Sanon with the stone head of Tezumateki. Guts, blood, and sinew exploded all over the place. Try living through that, you bastard, said Naruto. He then reached into the gaping hole of Orokimaru's throat, and after a few minutes, pulled out the book of Watanabe. It's over, said Naruto, as he sat himself down for a well-deserved break. Evening broke out when the four victorious shinobi emerged from the bunker. Fortunately for them, Tenten and Sasuke found another bunker entrance, which led them right towards Naruto and Sakura, who were coming from the other direction. I'm glad you're all alive, said Naruto. The feeling's mutual, remarked Sasuke. Did you get the book Naru? Asked Tenten. Naruto smiled and showed his friends the spoils of his victory. Where did you find it? Asked Sakura. In Orokimaru's stomach, said Naruto bluntly. The girl made a face of disgust, causing the boys to laugh a bit. Back to Kanoa then, said Naruto, as he turned to start heading home. Naruto, spoke up Sasuke, what do you plan on doing after this? About what? Come on Naruto, you know what I'm talking about. Naruto could be seen scratching the back of his head. He stood silent and frigid for a good amount of time. I just don't know, he replied. He's going to want to kill me, and I'm not sure yet if I want to kill him. But you are going to fight, said Tenten. Yes, answered Naruto. Then that's all we can ask, spoke up Sakura. Sakura, said Tenten. Look guys, he's just as confused as we are, explained Sakura. Can you really expect a solid answer from him? I guess not, said Tenten. Sorry Naru. Whatever happens, said Sasuke, you'd better come back alive. I intend to, said Naruto. Now let's go get this over with. It was the break of dawn, approximately one day after Hareze's deadline for the young Uzumaki. He wasn't concerned about that though, as he got up out of bed, not bothering to take a shower. Why bother cleaning yourself up if you might be living your last day as we speak? Naruto put on his orange attire, that he bought from Tenton's shop so long ago. He looked to his weapon, his, fist of the invincible, as if trying to get its opinion of the upcoming battle. Well, let's get going, a eh, Tezumateki. Naruto said to the axe, almost expecting it to answer back. He strapped it to his back, and led himself out to the living room. He grabbed a quick bite to eat, which mostly consisted of an apple, a carrot, and whatever he could find in his kitchen that he didn't have to cook. He walked over to the coffee table in the living room, where he looked over the reason he was so calm about today, a letter from Hooray's. Seems you barely made the deadline. I'll be generous this once towards you, and let you get back to the village. However, the very next morning, meet me at training ground 55, the one on the outskirts of the village. There we will have no interruptions, and I know you will come alone. One of us will leave the area, and come out with the knowledge of our village. Naruto tore up the note after one final look over it, and exited his apartment, possibly for the very last time. The shinobi took his time as he walked towards Kanoa's main gate. He tried to burn in his memory every street, every house, every shop, every sound, and everyone around him. Naruto finally couldn't stall any longer, as he reached the main gate. He was given a surprise though, as he was greeted by many of his friends and colleagues at the gate. 
He approached each one of them individually, and he started with the closest one, Avarang Shino. The bug master simply nodded towards the boy. Naruto took it as Shino's way of wishing him good luck with his upcoming battle. Naruto simply smiled and returned the nod. Next in line was Inazuka Kiba, who looked the blonde over one time. You sure you want your corpse to be found wearing that outfit? Taunted the dog boy. Who says I'm going to be the one killed? Retorted Naruto. I'll be back in time for dinner. You better be, said Kiba, in a serious tone, and extended his hand in friendship. Naruto took it, making sure to remember Kiba's hand and grip. It might be the only time he could. Hugo Neji was there, as stoic and stone-faced as ever. Any advice? Asked Naruto towards the prodigy. You don't need any, said Neji, just do what you always do in a fight, survive. That counts as advice you know, said Naruto with a smirk. HMPH, snorted Neji, just come back so I can give that smart mouth of yours a lesson in manners. Next was Neji's cousin, the heiress Hugo Hanata. She smiled at the boy she had just gotten to know over the past few months. You'll be just fine Naruto-san, she assured him. Well, coming from the prestigious Hugo heir, I better not disappoint, he smiled. He gave her a thumbs up before continuing on his way. The Hokage even came out to see him off, which brought a feeling of warmth to Naruto's heart. Hokage-sama, said Naruto, I hope you'll leave this to me. I know very well how you want this to be Naruto, replied Sunad. I have ordered an evacuation of all the training areas for the day. You'll be on your own, so you better not make it have been for nothing. I promise I won't, said Naruto, bowing to Sunad before continuing his farewells. Next was Yamanaka Ino, who approached Naruto and gave him a peck on the cheek. This startled Naruto to say the least. W what was that for? He exclaimed. An old Yamanaka tradition, Ino explained, when a family member is off on a dangerous mission, we give them a kiss to protect them. Well thanks Ino-chan but, asked Naruto, I'm not a Yamanaka. As far as I'm concerned, you're part of the family, she said. And I expect you to be there as the best man for when Sasuke finally gets the nerve to ask me. I'll keep that in mind, said Naruto, and made his way to the Uchiha in question. Well, this is it Sasuke, said Naruto. Sasuke nodded to the blonde. Listen Sasuke, if for some reason I don't come back. Naruto was cut off, as Sasuke pulled him in for a hug. Don't even think about finishing that sentence, he said to Naruto quietly in his ear. I already lost my family once before, and you're not leaving me now. Naruto just stood there for a moment, as he tried to fight back a tear that was trying to escape. He couldn't falter now, right before the fight of his life. He nodded to Sasuke, with an intent the Uchiha had never seen before. The boy finally reached the gate, and saw the two most precious people to him waiting patiently for him. 10. Sakura, he said. I promise I'll be back. We know, they said in unison. There was no need for words between the three of them. All Tenten and Sakura needed was his word. They both gave him a peck on the cheek, and then joined the others to see him off. Naruto finally left, giving one last glance at the village before making his way to the training area. Naruto got there sooner than he thought, seeing as training area 55 was the one farthest from the village's borders. For the most part, it was an area shinobi used for training in advanced tojitsu. The majority of the area was a grassy meadow, with hills here and there, but for the most part was a flat surface. The grass itself was exceptionally long, as long as straws of wheat or barley. A faint wind was blowing across the field, making the ground look like the scalp of a giant as the grass swayed under its touch. There were a few trees here and there, but for the most part there was no real place for concealment. As such, a shinobi would have trouble trying to unleash ninjutsu and genjutsu in such an open area, where they could easily be attacked before they completed their technique. The tall grass was made for concealing tojitsu attacks, as one could use it to prepare a weapon, or deliver an unexpected blow. Naruto looked for his opponent, and saw him leaning against the tree. To Hurei's right, on the ground next to the tree, stood four old books. Hurei's looked at his opponent, but didn't bother to even move or greet the Uzumaki. Naruto pulled out the two books he collected, and held them over his head, one in each hand. I've got what you want, said Naruto. Now pony up your end of the deal. 
Hares didn't answer Naruto's demand however, and in a few seconds, shot a two-fold arrow flurry at Naruto. The arrows were going in opposite directions, and soon embedded themselves in the Seriuku logs Naruto held. It was then Naruto noticed that the two arrows were connected with wire on the ends, but it was too late. Hares effortlessly reeled in both logs towards him, where he then placed them on top of the other four he had. You have to defeat me first Uzumaki, stated Hares. Or have you forgotten that part of your mission? Naruto was taken aback at that remark. How did you know about that? He asked the Tatsujin. It's pretty easy to gather that the Hokage sees me as a threat, he answered. Besides, I know that you want me dead. I've never wished for anyone's death that didn't seek it, retorted Naruto. Besides, I don't even know why you want me dead. You know very well why I want you dead, traitor. Snapped Hares. The fact that you keep denying it is all the more reason to take your life. So, it has to go down like this, eh? Said Naruto, as he unsheathed Tezumateki. He got into his stance. So be it. Did you know all of these training areas are given unique nicknames? Asked Hares, as he loosened himself up and prepared himself for a fight. There is a fitting nickname for this training area, would you like to hear it? Humor me, said Naruto, never faltering from his focus. It's called the, Field of Heroes, and one of us will be a hero when we leave. The other will adorn the place with a fresh coat of blood. The two combatants stared each other, looking for a chance to attack. Naruto, of course, would choose to let his opponent make the first move, so he could capitalize. It was what Futeki trained him to master, and trying a new style or tactic today would be his downfall. Hares took a stance much like the one he used on Naruto those many years ago. His left fist was tucked to his side, the crossbow attachment folded inward so as not to poke him in the hip. His right claw was raised to shoulder level, and he then proceeded to attack, charging with an aggressive speed. Naruto held Tezumateki vertically, and blocked Hares's first strike, the shaft connecting with a section of Hares's armored hand, in between two of his clawed fingers. Naruto then applied a quick burst of chakra, and twisted the shaft of his axe, sending Hares off balance as he was dragged along by his claw. Hares counted however, as he used a burst of chakra from his foot to counterbalance his momentum, and held his right arm up just in time to block a vertical strike from Tezumateki. Hares then let his legs go out from under him, and wrapped them around Naruto's right leg, striking at the back of his knee to force him onto the ground. He brought himself up, looking downward at Naruto's exposed backside, and tried to deliver a thrust to the back of the head. Naruto dodged a strike to the left, then to the right, before stretching his left arm behind him, connecting with Hares in the forehead. The Tatsujin released his basic hold on Naruto's leg, and staggered back a few steps into a defensive position. He expected Naruto to follow up with his assault, but found that Naruto took the time to pick himself up and get into his defensive stance once again. You should have attacked, said Hares. I don't take orders from you, smirked Naruto. It wasn't an order, it was a warning, retorted Hares, and suddenly Naruto felt a presence coming at him from three directions. Three shadows had been formed in the time it took Naruto to get up, and now he found himself with three feet jutted into his jaw, sending him flying into the air. Hares, in a brilliant display of kata, started and finished a technique in what appeared to be a blur to the human eye. Yajinteki Renden, announced Hares, and pulled out his arm crossbow. His right hand moved with blurring speed, as the Tatsujin fired hundreds of arrows at his prone victim. Naruto wasn't directly hit however, as it seemed the technique was made to wound him rather than finish him off. Slowly but surely, tears in Naruto's clothes started to show, and small and minor cuts started to bleed. Naruto soon enough fell back to the unforgiving earth. Hares made no move to finish the blonde shinobi off though. Get up, we both know that last technique didn't finish you off, he ordered to Naruto. Naruto got up on his own accord. However, as a surprise to Hares, a fox-like grin was shown on the Uzumaki's slightly bleeding mug. If that's the best you got, said Naruto, I think I'll be home in time for supper. Such arrogance, said Hares, shaking his head. I suppose it will make it all the more enjoyable to kill you. Hares slapped his left arm with his right hand, and using his left foot, and a bit of chakra, propelled himself towards Naruto, his clawed arm heading straight towards him. Naruto sidestepped the fast attack, and swung the tip of Tezumateki at Hares's feet, causing him to trip. 
Hooray's recovered quickly, and just in time as Naruto followed his trip attack with trying to drive the tip into his spine. He rolled out of the way, and springboarded himself back to his feet. It was obvious to Hooray's now what he was against in Naruto Uzumaki. It seems that since he last fought the blonde, he had found himself a teacher in defensive jiu-jitsu. However, Hooray's style was well versatile, and he knew a way to handle such a person. He charged Naruto once again, he led it with his right claw arm tightened into a fist, causing Naruto to prepare himself, but then fainted the Uzumaki by sidestepping him completely. He then swung his entire body, trying to build momentum as he aimed for Naruto's head with the back of his right hand. However, Hooray's made a mistake in his judgment. He had only tried single strikes at Naruto so far, and he assumed that any combinations would confuse and break down the Uzumaki. However, Naruto was holding himself back, only exerting a little more effort when it was needed. He had Tezumateki on at his front, held vertically to block the fist, but suddenly swung the axe behind him, blocking Hooray's back fist with the shaft of the axe. He smirked at Hooray's as he blocked the attack. Hooray's quirked a brow, what was he smiling about? He was just lucky with blocking the attack right. Naruto had done more than just put Tezumateki behind him, the blade was a crescent shape, and the hook of it had landed right under Hooray's left leg. Naruto put both hands on Tezumateki's shaft, and proceeded to catapult Hooray's over his body, flipping him like a pancake. Hooray's was taken by complete surprise, and landed harshly on the ground. Naruto quickly followed it up, and flipped Tezumateki to its stone head. He slammed it right next to Hooray's head. As Hooray's gave thanks that Naruto missed, he suddenly felt a force underneath him. Suchiden, Rifuto Wakunaku, exclaimed Naruto, as Hooray's was launched into the air by the giant earth pillar. Naruto then began to swing Tezumateki over his head. Hooray's sensed incoming danger, so he righted himself with a burst of chakra from his feet and shoulders, and started to make kata in midair. Maru Seyuku, shouted Naruto, as he unleashed the disc of cutting chakra towards Hooray's. Hooray's had finished, in the world of Shinobi, an extremely long string of kata just in time. It was now or never, and with this Hooray's pulled out of his his trump cards. Tatsujinden, you and Kyanseru Kabushi, shouted Hooray's, as his left fist formed a distinct purple colored chakra. He then slammed the fist right at the oncoming chakra ring. The two chakra masses collided, struggling with each other for a while, before dispersing each other, sending scraps of chakra everywhere. Hooray's was hit with barrage of shrapnel, as was Naruto as some came raining down from the sky. Most of the chakra caused flesh wounds on the skin. Some of the larger chakra pieces however, embedded deep into the flesh of both combatants before disappearing completely. Naruto fell to a knee, as he tried to endure the pain, both from the physical pain and the mental pain that Hooray's caused by countering the Maru Seyuku. Hooray's tried to land on his feet, but took too much damage and fell on his butt. The two locked eyes once again, panting in pain as they tried to regain their strength. I've got one's last card to play, thought Naruto. Thinking back on his previous encounters, he knew that Hooray's had one card left too, the Condore Tuzmi. Naruto and Hooray's got onto their feet at the same time, and approached each other. They both were feeling fatigue, mostly due to all the minor wounds adding up to a lot of lost blood. They came within fighting distance, and started to exchange blows. Some were blocked, while some connected with their intended target. They soon came to a grapple, as Naruto fought against Hooray's arms with the shaft of Tezumateki. Hooray's, in a clever move, tightened the grip in his right arm, and then let go of his left hand to punch Naruto in the forehead. Naruto took several blows, managing to maintain his stance and grip, until a blow to the gut caused him to let go of his axe. Hooray's channeled any chakra he had left, and flung Tezumateki into the air, the axe soaring out of sight. The Tatsujin then backed off a ways before summoning any strength he had left. Kondore Sum, he cried, and then charged at Naruto. The purple claws were perfectly formed, and it was certain that Naruto would not survive the move a second time. Naruto quickly brought up both of his hands, and gripped Hirei's forearm, holding the claws just out of reach from Naruto's chest. The two struggled for what seemed like hours, and then Hirei started using his left hand to deliver more blows to Naruto's head. Naruto took each hit, knowing that to let go of his grip would mean his death. Naruto leaned backwards, and used his left leg to throw Hirei's over him in a judo technique. 
Naruto spring boarded to his feet, and Hurei somehow managed to shift his weight in midair yet again, landing on his feet as well. Hurei's turned around, ready to deliver the final blow. It seemed the world slowed down as to watch the end of this battle itself. Hurei's turned around, and his confident smile turned into a look of shock. Naruto was standing up, and Tezumateki was on his shoulder. Without any hesitance, he swung the blade down across Hurei's body. Kazuato Itonami Kyo Aoju, Naruto said, only allowing Hurei's to hear his voice. The first thing Hurei's noticed was the white hot fire that burned throughout his entire body. It seemed slightly painful over his body, but extremely bone melting where Naruto struck him. After a minute however, the fire died down, and soon he felt nothing but an overwhelming numbness. His body wouldn't move, no matter how much he demanded it did so. The Tatsujin fell flat on his back, a small thud as his jelly-like body absorbed the shockwave. Hurei's found that his body was slowly becoming useless. He could still breathe, and his mouth still worked. Most of all, Hurei's eyes were functioning perfectly as Naruto approached his prone opponent, and sat on the ground unceremoniously. It started when I was a boy, said Hurei's, noticing that it was getting a bit hard to breathe, and he knew why. Ha! Huh, asked Naruto. Obviously he was confused to his enemy's confession. When I was a boy, I loved many things, continued Hurei's. But the most enjoyable activity was sitting down on the floor of the family room in my house, and listen to my father read stories to me. It was then Naruto heard a sizzling sound, and looked down towards Hurei's feet. The skin was slowly burning away. Not from fire though, but it seemed that Hurei's own chakra system was eating at him. Hurei's, exclaimed Naruto. My clan techniques are powerful, but they came with a price, answered Hurei's. My body must constantly release chakra on a regular basis. If I don't after a while, my chakra overwhelms my body. And now that I can't control my body, I'm doomed to waste away. Anyways, said Hurei's, but whenever father told a story about our clan's past, there was different. It was subtle, like the rising of the side of his lip, or a twitch of the eye. It was after a while that I knew all too well what those signs meant. Naruto just sat and listened. He occasionally glanced downward at Hurei's body, and saw the feet were completely gone. There wasn't a trace of anything, not even a chip of bone. The legs were halfway gone as well. He didn't bother to inform the Tatsujin though, as this was his final testament. He was crying to himself. He was slowly dying with every word he uttered about the rise and fall about my clan, our clan. And when I was young, I kept telling myself that I would bring the clan back to glory. But I had to right the one wrong that happened. I had to kill the one clan that destroyed my people. I had to destroy the one clan that made my father cry. And when father first told me the name of the clan that led to our destruction, I burned it into my memory, he looked to Naruto. And I guess, in the end, I failed. The Tatsujin were never meant to thrive once again. Now worse of all, I'm off to tell my father and my ancestors that it's my fault. Naruto, for the first time since he met this man, felt pity for her race. He could understand his devotion to his family. In a way, Naruto admired the fact that he dedicated himself to making his clan the greatest in the land once again. I thought of you as just another psychopath who wanted to kill for the sheer joy of it, responded Naruto. But then most psychopaths aren't careful enough to reach the goal while keeping casualties to a minimum. Those ninja you sent for me and Futeki seemed to be nothing but minor thugs. And the council was full of people with only their own agenda, so I'm not sorry they're dead. You know, said Naruto, if it weren't for this stupid ability, maybe we wouldn't have to be at each other's throats. If we met under different circumstances, I might even have been a friend to you. Don't get soft on me, scoffed Hurei's. I made my decision, and I have no regrets. I did what I did for my family, for my clan. It's just that in the end, it was the Uzumaki that were to thrive. Still, you were right about our Konwaza. I have a last request, said Hurei's. What is that? asked Naruto. The Seriuku logs, burn them, he answered. Why? Those logs contain a lot of precious information, and as long as it exists, people will be at each other's throats for them. I'm not asking you to acknowledge your clan's involvement with the Seriuku Sato Purotekuto, but I'm asking you to prevent another one from coming to be. Naruto looked over to the six logs, still resting quietly next to the tree where Hurei's left them. 
He then looked to the Tatsujin and nodded. Good, said Horace. You might want to leave me now, you won't want to see the rest of me fade away. Okay, said Naruto, standing up. He walked over to the books, picked them up. And with a final look towards Horace, Naruto left him in silence. It wasn't know what happened after Naruto left. When Shinobi came the day afterwards, there was no evidence of Horace Tatsujin, save for a small indent in the middle of the grassy meadow. Naruto passed through the open gates to Kanoa, and was greeted with a loud applause. He looked up to see that his friends had returned to see his inevitable return. Upon seeing his condition, Neji and Kiba quickly took him into their shoulders. The Seriuku logs dropped out from under his arms, and were quickly picked up by Sakura and Tenten. Soon it ordered that Naruto be taken to the hospital immediately. Naruto was for the most part okay. He had suffered major cuts and bruising all over his body, along with other superficial wounds. The major cuts were sewn up and wrapped in bandages. He was given a small pint of blood to compensate for all the blood he lost during the battle and the return home. He was sent home a few days later when he showed signs of improvement. Naruto slowly entered his apartment, and found that he had company. Tenten and Sakura were there, as was to be expected since they knew of his release date well in advance. However, Sasuke and Ino also had stopped by for a visit. Ino and Sasuke were on the couch and armchair that adorned the living room, and Sakura and Tenten took the rest of the couch for themselves. Naruto sat himself down on the remaining chair. What's the occasion? asked Naruto. Naruto, started Sasuke, I know that you want to know the truth behind your clan's past. The other five Seriuku logs are back with Tsunitsama, waiting to be destroyed. And my clan log. Tada! exclaimed Sakura, as she produced the Uzumaki log from behind her spot on the couch. I convinced Tsunid Shisu to allow you at least a look before it was sent to the shredder. Are you sure it wasn't to just satisfy your own curiosity? interjected Naruto. The remark got him a couple of coughing and sounds of clearing of the throat. All right, surrendered the blonde. You can look at it too, but I just want to know about one thing. What exactly happened the day of the Seriuku massacre? Sakura flipped through the pages of the log, stopping somewhere near the end of it. She slowly scanned the pages, and when she found a relevant starting point, read aloud the entry verbatim. Autumn, third month. Things are for the most part stable in our village. Our mission requests are coming in at a regular pace, and we want for nothing in our everyday lives. My wife is spending less time helping out around the house, and more time resting as the day of my son's birth comes closer. However, I worry that my son will be born in a most troubling time for the village. Bickering and arguing between the six clans has reached a point that not even my own father lived to witness. Our village is thought of on the outside to be a place built on the foundations of honor and power. However, on the inside one finds it to be built on paranoia and fear. Every day a new conspiracy theory is spread amongst the populace, but there never seems to be any proof. I find it especially ironic that the clans talk of a system of trust and yet not one of them trusts the rest of the village with their most known of secrets, the log of each clan. I'm not a fool born with never changing ideals. I know that this village will not be forever. Even the greatest nations one day will become a footnote in history. Even the greatest sites and villages will one day only be known as abandoned ruins. The greatest leaders and kings will one day only come up in discussions of forgotten ways of life. Still, I must try to see to it that my son and my family are given a chance to make their own impact on history. I will hope that the tension in this village will fade a bit by the time my son is born. Winter first month. The situation has taken a turn for the worst. A few weeks ago a giant confrontation exploded in the center of the village. It was between the Yagi and the Watanabe clans. The Yagi was accusing the Watanabe spreading negative rumors about them towards our village's clients, persuading them to look to the other clans for missions. The Watanabe countered with an accusation that the Yagi were simply trying to provoke a clan war, so in the confusion they could advance their own desires. The arguing quickly became shouting, and then it ended when a Watanabe was slashed across the throat by a Yagi's blade. The Yagi was immediately tried and sentenced to death for the crime of violence against a fellow village shinobi. The village seemed satisfied that justice was served and that the situation was over. I had a suspicion at the time that the bloodshed had only just begun. 
It was just last week that the Bison pressed charges against the Tatsujin for allegedly spying on Bison family meetings and training sessions. This was a severe crime in our paranoid village, and sometimes would lead to death for the convicted. It was a rare occurrence though. However the Tatsujin are almost always the accused in these situations. They are quite capable of using their soul slaves to spy on the other clans. And by the time anyone found out, the spy in question had, conveniently, died a few days before the incident. The Tatsujin are envied for this technique, but in a way they are the only ones I would trust with the knowledge. I am further persuaded to trust them based on the fact that the Tatsujin only use the technique on enemy ninja and corrupt or violent men. It's almost in my mind that the slave claw technique is only sated by the souls of the evil and the wicked. It wasn't the first time I witnessed such arguments against the Tatsujin. And once again, the Tatsujin denied everything. But something was different this time. The grave crime of spying was even more grave considering that the Bison accused the Tatsujin of spying and gathering information from their log book. Those logs, every time I hear them mentioned I can't help but wonder about what would life be like if they weren't around. If our Konwaza never existed, perhaps this would be a village of honor and peace. Of course, one could not destroy the books without people from each clan cooperating towards a common goal. Even if one did however, the village would erupt into total civil war. Mutual destruction seems to be the only possible ending the more I mull over it. Spring, first month, this will be my last entry. As I speak, flames are eating away at the numerous houses and buildings. The clashing of blades and the cries of pain echo in the calm night air. It is because of me that chaos is coming upon us. I, by either luck or divine providence, had managed to take all the Seriuku logs from the five other clans. Once it was realized they were gone, the fears and demons within the clans became unleashed. In search of their logs and to regain their honor, all six clans have begun to slaughter each other. Men, women, and even children are being killed simply for being different than their attacker. My fellow clansmen are also at war, mostly in self-defense. I had kept this task strictly to myself, and I regret that my clansmen will suffer for my selfishness. Though it might not do any good, I will try to leave a testimony of my actions. Last entry, I discussed my belief that the only way for progress and peace to come to the village would be mutual destruction. Still, I was a hopeful person and was planning to usher in a new era to the Seriuku village. But I will not regret my decision, not in the slightest. Perhaps it is time to put the village into history. At least there, its destructive behaviors won't poison the rest of world. I would think to make an example of this village by letting the world bear witness to its implosion. I will soon go out to play my part in that implosion, as my wife prepares to flee with my son, still in the womb. For the son I will never see, I leave a message. You have been born with a great power, but also a heavy burden. A Konwaza user is always linked to this village, and this village is always linked to the clan logs. Should the fires not be enough to destroy the logs, the world will indeed be poisoned with their taint, and succumb to paranoia, fear, and hatred. Remember this, and I am sure that this will never be. I have never seen your face, but I don't need to. I have no doubt about the person you will be. You will become a person with many friends, and many loved ones. As for your being a shinobi, it's in the Konwaza blood. You will bear a heavy burden with your technique, but it will forge you into a man worthy of praise. I wish you nothing but happiness son, and know that you have parents that love you. It was at that point, Sakura closed the book. The pink-haired Kunoiki was so absorbed in reading aloud, she didn't notice the effect she had on the others. Tenten and Ino to her sides had giant smiles on their faces, and even looked to be tearing a bit. Sasuke had his eyes wielded shut, but a bemused smile was on his face. Naruto was quiet though, he wasn't crying, nor was he trying to fight back tears. He slowly blinked, and looked to be in contemplation over the words of his father. Well then, said Sasuke, getting out of his chair, and pulling Ino up on her feet. I guess that's it then. Ino and I will be heading home then. Going so soon, asked Naruto, snapping out of his trance. I think you need some private time now, answered Sasuke. Good to know you'll be around for a while Naruto. We'll see you around later. And with that Sasuke and Ino found their own way out. Naruto found a spot on the couch between Tenten and Sakura. He held the log of his clan in his hands, feeling the wrought and tattered texture of the cover. 
So, asked Tenten, any questions about your past Naru? Nah, said Naruto, I never questioned my past anyways. So why bother trying to get you clan log? Asked Sakura. Yeah, interjected Tenten, the fact that you fought a race to the death has to show you care at least a little bit. I always knew that I was never a traitor, said Naruto. But I could see this cloud of doubt over the village towards me, especially during the Summit of Elders. I just wanted to show the village that I was genuine, ended Naruto. Sakura and Tenten looked at each other at that statement, and then each wrapped an arm around him. We already know how wonderful you are Naruto, said Sakura. And you don't have to rush such a thing, added Tenten. In time, the whole world will know just how special you really are. Thanks you too, said Naruto. It's good to know you keep things in perspective for me. Well, now that all that, thinking, is over, said Tenten, clapping her hands together and getting up off the couch. How about we go about some celebration and enjoying something fun? That's a good idea, said Sakura. Naruto remained on the couch, still holding the Uzumaki log in his hands. The two kunoiki looked at him, then at each other, then back to him. After a minute of silence, a wicked smile appeared on their faces. They both headed towards Naruto's bedroom. Say Naruto, asked Sakura. You think you can show us a bit of what makes you, special? At the same time, added Tenten. The tone of their voices and the implication of their words caused Naruto's head to shoot up so straight, he almost broke it off his neck. He turned his head to see two lovely young women enter his bedroom. He turned to the book still in his hands. He should destroy the log as soon as possible, but it can wait, he told himself, and sprinted to his bedroom. The Uzumaki log rested peacefully on the table of his living room. Five years later, it was a bright sunny day in Kanoa, as the days of spring gave way to the start of a warm summer season. Still, it was a quiet day for the village, and the two shinobi in charge of gate duty today had seen little action. It was the early afternoon however, so the day could still provide fruit. The two gate shinobi had two visitors to the village, and they began the duties. Halt, addressed the guard, state your business in Konohagakur. There were two young men approaching them, with a third figure in the distance behind them. One of the young men was covered in a black cloak, which covered his entire body, save for his feet which wore sturdy black boots. The other was wearing chain mail mesh with a brown vest over it, with long brown sleeves covering his arms. He had on grey shinobi slacks, and wore black boots of the same fashion as his companion. The notable traits were the kanji for, love, above his left green eye, and the giant gourd strapped to his back. The brown-clad one showed papers of identification to the guard. Don't you fools recognize the Kazekage when you see her? Asked the man. Kankuro and Gara, ages 24 and 23 respectively, had become special duty anbu in direct command of the Kazekage. Over the past years, Kankuro had become recognized by his village as a master of puppet ninjutsu, and was said to have over 100 in his arsenal. Gara, after his brief encounter with Uzumaki Naruto, had taken a turn for the better. While his convictions remained as stalwart as ever, he was more collected and wouldn't jump the gun as much as he used to during the coup de tort in Sunagakur. Now now, came a female voice, and the four men turned their heads in the direction of the third figure. She had a white cloak and mantle attached to her shoulders. Underneath it, was a mix of causal dress and shinobi protection. The woman had shinobi chain mail as well, and was overlaid with a white tube top. Her bottom half had on white dress slacks, and white shoes with a bit of dust from the ground itself. It's not every day we come to this village right. Besides, today is the day of our friend's celebration. Temari, age 26, had become both the youngest and the first female Kazekage in history. Reluctant at first, her brothers convinced her that she had the best skill set fitting of a cage. While inexperienced, her elders remarked their approval of her dedication and tenacity. As Kazekage, Temari completely destroyed the monarchy system of rule in Sunagakur. She instead implied more of a militaristic system of power. She was the head of a long branch of offices and employees that oversaw all business within the village. This however, did not mean she didn't keep a close eye on everyone, for she wanted to never see another coot in her lifetime. With Gara and Kankuro by her side and helping her the whole time however, that was unlikely to happen. Our apologies, said the guard, we were simply doing our job. 
You may proceed, and enjoy your stay. The three Sooner citizens then made their way to their destination. Meanwhile, over in one of the many cafes in Kanoa, a discussion was happening. Please Hanata Sama, said a man, on his bended knee with his hands held out. We need you to come back immediately to the house. They were directing their comments to a beautiful young woman. She had on high heels, an expensive looking white slacks, which had a cobalt blue stripe running down the middle of the leg. Her upper body had on a unique type of sweater vest, which was also white. The sleeves were long, but only covered the top part of each of her arms. The sleeves reached to her hands, which had small straps for which one could put their fingers in place to keep the sleeves in position. Her eyes were like glass, and sparkled like brilliant diamonds when hit with the sunlight coming into the shop. Her hair was a cobalt blue, and was kept trimmed and at neck length. Her pale white skin made her look like her exhibit in a famous museum. Oh please you guys, she said to the man and his silent companion to his left. I'm sure the Huga clan will cease to exist if their leader takes one day off. But, started the other man, before he was interrupted by the slamming of one's palms on the table the woman was sitting at. The perpetrator was a wild-looking man. His brown hair was cut in the fashion of a flat top. While he looked clean and kept, his brown eyes held back a savage heritage. He was dressed in black slacks and shirt, with a red belt and tie. The tie had white stripes running down it diagonally. You heard the lady, you too. He barked at the men. Now get out of here before you start to annoy both of us. At this threat the two men scattered like scolded pets. The man then let out a breath he was holding in and sat himself back down onto the table. Hugo Hanata and Inazuka Kiba, both aged 23, had shocked the entire village with the announcement of their marriage. It started off as simple time together, but then soon they were spending a lot of time together. Soon friendship turned to deeper feelings, and the two had admitted their love for each other. Naturally, both of their families were in an outrage at the two of them dating. The Huga denounced Hanata for mingling with, loud, unkempt, obnoxious, people like the Inazuka. Kiba's kin also scolded him for dating one of the, elitist, eccentric, snobbish, Huga. In the end though, they both went with what they wanted rather than the good of their clans. When Kiba was promoted to Anbu as an expert in reconnaissance, and could finally afford to support someone more than himself, he asked for Hanata's hand in marriage. She gladly accepted, and despite protests, both clans attended the wedding ceremony. Kiba had remained with the Anbu for a year before he found another calling, teaching. He was admitted into the Kanoa Academy as a teacher for the first-year students. He made the jump for two reasons. The first was that he found a knack for it, and eventually found he liked having the power to order around students and mold them into his vision of the perfect shinobi. The second was because of his wife. Hanata was abruptly made the leader of the Huga family when her father, Hyashi resigned the position. He said his reason was that he was tired of the burden of taking care of both the head and branch families, but it was never known if that was his only reason. Hanata's first act as clan leader was to dissolve the two families and merge them into one giant clan. While this system was celebrated by the branch family, and destroyed the use of the cursed seal forever, it led to the clan being far too large for one person to oversee everything. It was at this that Hanata asked her little sister Hinabi, and her cousin Neji, to aid her in dividing the clan into more sizable chunks. Kiba played a role in this as well, as Hanata would come to him for support and another view of the situation. After a while Kiba moved in with Hanata over in the Huga main house, and became almost nobility in the eyes of the Huga. Kiba didn't let it get to his head though, and he never forgot the clan he was born to. Are we done with lunch? said Kiba. Hanata nodded. Yes, ready to go to the party. Hanata asked her husband, to which he grinned. By the way, thanks for taking care of those guys for me. No problem, the only person that gets to beg in front of you is me, said Kiba, a look of realization coming to his face. That didn't come out right. Nope, sounds right to me, teased Hanata. Kiba groaned as Hanata and himself walked out of the cafe. Is Shino going to be able to make it? asked Hanata voicing a sudden thought that came to her. Sadly no, said Kiba. He's locked up in business out of town. Abarain Shino, age 23, resigned as a full-time shinobi at the age of 21. While this type of resignation is uncommon, it wasn't unheard of. 
Shino became a researcher, mostly in the area of insects and how they could benefit humanity. His research bore fruit, as he managed to find antitoxin for several poisons used in the shinobi community. He traveled from city to city, and village to village, sharing his research with anyone who would listen. His work also helped to forge a new legacy for the Abarain clan. The couple walked themselves to the party, while passing along the way the Uchiha household. Inside the compound, inside the living room, there was a gorgeous woman preparing herself for what looked like a night on the town. Her blonde hair was like strings of pure gold growing from her scalp. She had on a long dress shaded in a pretty royal purple. She had on earrings, which were shaped to look like flowers, with her amethyst in the center of each flower. Honey, she shouted to no one in particular, are you ready? The party will start soon. I'm coming, said a male voice, and a man emerged from one of the connecting rooms. He was in a blue dress shirt, and had the long sleeves rolled up to the wrist. His spiky jet black hair had been kept untouched. He was wearing black jeans, and held them in place with a leather belt. A peculiar scent could be found to be floating about him. It smelled like a mix of pheromone and lavender. I'm ready, said the man, as he walked over to look the women over. You're looking good, said the man. Of course, it's a party after all, remarked the woman. Uchiha Sasuke and Uchiha Yamanaka Ino, ages 23 and 24 respectively, had both prestigious careers in the Anbu. Sasuke was a general field commander, while Ino worked for the interrogation branch under the tutelage of the renowned Morino Ibiki. Ino's parents retired, and had moved to another country to live out the golden years. Ino, having her parents' permission, sold off the flower shop, and used the money to refurbish the Uchiha compound. The inevitable came when Ino reached 21. It happened in a way thought, that she had never expected. It was the annual Yamanaka family meeting, where all the members would gather for a day of fun and catching up with family. Sasuke came bursting in through the front door of the family house, and made beeline right here for Ino. He wasn't upset however, he just had a serious look on his face. Ino didn't know what to make of this, but she understood soon enough when Sasuke, in front of her entire family, asked her to be his wife. The two were married almost immediately, as they had the ceremony a remarkable week after Sasuke's proposal, a record in the village of Kanoa. The two lovers came out of their house and made their way to the party. The celebration was being held at a remarkable new mansion that had finished being built on the outskirts of town. Well, it wasn't a mansion, but since it was made for a very important person, it was bigger than your average house. It was a two-story, and was made of marble, brick, and maple. It looked like an ancient monument from the outside, as the marble columns held aloft the edge of the roof hovering over the entrance patio. The inside was amazing. The living room was the first room one entered when inside, and it was larger than two normal rooms combined. It was hardwood, and had a sheen of wax. It was almost like a ballroom, made to accommodate large numbers of guests. There was a stairway that led to the second floor, which was empty and bare for the occasion. To the left was a doorway leading to a kitchen, which seemed to be state-of-the-art at a glance. In the middle of the living room were the hosts of the party. Two were women, who apparently decided to dress in the same attire. They were long pink, dresses, which covered the entire body. They appeared to be Chinese in style, with ornate button hooks on the chest, and an outline of fabric that ran over the whole dress. They were cut at the waist, creating a flap on each side. One girl had pink hair, which was shoulder length and allowed to fall freely from her head. Her green eyes seemed to be more polished. Her face was more defined, with full eyes, trimmed cheeks, and full lips. The other girl had brown eyes and black hair. Her hair appeared to be shoulder length as well, but it was tied up into a bun ponytail combo that fell from the back of her head. Her face was smaller and more compact than her counterparts, but held a beauty of its own. The other host was a man dressed in red and white garb. It was an intricate ensemble, with a traditional men's hakama with obi, kyahan, and subaki. A brown obi belt was wrapped around the man's waist. The man also was wearing a white mantle and cloak with red trim. His yellow hair shone like the sun, and was gelled and spiked which made it glisten in the light. He bore whisker birthmarks, had blue eyes which pierced even the most closed soul. Thanks for coming, said the blonde, a huge smile appearing on his face. Now let's have some fun.
Tenton, age 23, became a legend in her own right. Seeming to take a page from Futeki's book, Tenton became a collector of rare, exotic, and powerful weapons. She became a part-time teacher at Kanoa Academy, to which she taught students the ways of both Tajitsu and weapon skills. During the rest of her time, she would be given missions that required her own unique touch. She had never failed a mission since, a precedent never heard of before in any shinobi village. Tenton's deeds became the stuff of rumors, which became fables, which then became legends. She was recognized as a weapon master, unofficially, by the world. There was no such official title, but Tenton knew all the same that she was the best in the world. Her smile could never be erased when people would talk about her remarkable accomplishments as a kunoiki, an anbu, and a person. Haruno Sakura, age 23, also made a remarkable career for herself. When her teacher, the Gondaim Chuand, passed away at the age of 67, Sakura immediately was called to step up to take the role of administrator and chief of medicine for Kanoa Hospital. However, the Rokudaim proposed, and managed to convince the Summit of Elders, to hire an administrative body to deal with the bureaucratic processes that ran a hospital. This was a welcome addition to Sakura, as she could now focus on the treatment of her patients. She was quite lucky in the fact that it was a hospital in a shinobi village. As such, people, shinobi and civilian alike, were not as prone to injury as normal people. This allowed Sakura much more free time compared to a normal doctor. Sakura was a person who was both feared for her prowess in combat, and cherished for her skill in the medical field. The pink-haired Kunoiki, in the minds of Kanoa, had truly become the Yondime's true heir. Uzumaki Naruto, age 23, was recognized as Rokudime Hokage a few days ago. It was a heated debate amongst the people in charge of finding the next cage. But after much deliberation, thought, and hearing the public opinion, it was decided that Naruto's deeds, as well as his loyalty to Kanoa, was enough to warrant him to become cage. The ceremony was too over the top for Naruto's personal taste, as he was marched down the main village road, decked out in clothing even more gaudy and ornate than the outfit he bore for now for the party. Still, it took all his effort to not break down in the middle of the road. It wouldn't be a good impression if he showed the village the next cage in the fetal position in the middle of the street. It was only a few days since his inauguration, but the festivities around the village seemed to have an eternal life to them. For now though, Naruto was content to just have a private celebration in honor of his making cage, and his new house he managed to afford due to the, bonus, a cage received in advance of his yearly salary. Naruto had never seen so much money in his entire life, where was this money when he was in a broken down apartment? The festivities were nothing short of heartwarming, as soon more guests throughout the village came to give their respect to the new cage. Naruto was the toast of the party, and he was egged into giving dozens of toasts to the guests, as well as hear so many from the guests towards him. There were no housewarming gifts, except for arguably for the kiss Ino gave her, brother-in-law, in her own words. Kiba dragged Naruto towards one of the plush couches and along with the other men talked and laughed as they told their best stories. As such with a waxed hardwood floor, Naruto was also asked to dance with the ladies, in some instances dancing with the girl twice. The new hockage actually surprised everyone as he managed not to mangle his partner's feet. Food was plentiful, and alcohol was indeed offered to the guests. Tenton provided some entertainment when she brought to the living room three full-length katana and proceeded to juggle them for her audience. The girls were a tight niche as well. It seemed like every single minute either Tenton and Sakura were pulled in by the other girls and asked about Naruto. The questions ranged from his favorite food, a silly question, to more intimate questions concerning his sexual stamina. Tenton and Sakura were ladylike enough though, to simply wave off such questions and say they wouldn't tell a soul. Slowly but surely, the party died down, until Naruto, Sakura, and Tenton were the sole inhabitants of the house. What a party, said an exhausted Naruto, collapsing onto one of his new couches. He sighed happily as the new cushions engulfed his body. We'll have to clean this up, you know Naru, said Tenton, scoffing at her boyfriend. That can wait for the morning, said Sakura. Besides, it's not like this place is a war zone. Nope, to me, this place looks like heaven, said Naruto as he got himself up. Which would be the perfect place to do something. The two kunoiki looked at their boyfriend. He approached both of them, and took one hand in each of his. Naruto blew out a breath, 
his breath lightly hitting the two women in the face. Girls, I know you were just here for the party, but now I've got a problem, he explained. Ya see, this place is way too big for my dumbass, way too big for any one person. So I was wondering if you move in with me, but not as girlfriends, said Naruto, and shuffled around in his robes. He pulled out two boxes, and handed one to both Sakura and Tenten. Naruto then pulled out another box from his robes. He waited for the girls to open the gifts. Inside were two rings, both different, but both equally stunning. The rings were made of solid gold. On top of the rings were a unique decoration. Sakura's ring had a cherry blossom on top, about 10 centimeters in diameter. Each petal had a small ruby at the tip, eight in all. The middle was made of a giant ruby, cut to perfection. Tenten's ring was also gold, but the decoration was different from Sakura's. It was shielded with two swords crisscrossed. The total decoration was about 10 square centimeters in area. The parts of the sword that were exposed were made of white gold, and were encrusted with tiny diamonds. The shield was a onyx polished to perfection. I want you to move into this home, as my wives, said Naruto. Sakura, Tenten, will you make me the luckiest man in history and marry me? Tenten and Sakura knew this day was coming. They knew that it was only a matter of time before Naruto popped the question. However, they couldn't stop the tears from coming out of their eyes. They clamped onto his body, almost knocking him down onto the floor. Yes, they both shouted at the top of their lungs. Naruto simply smiled as he released the girls. Naruto carefully placed both rings on both Tenten and Sakura. He then opened the third box, which was another gold ring. The decoration on top was the face of a fox. The eyes were sapphires, and there were whiskers on its face. Each whisker was tipped with a diamond. Naruto gave the ring to both his finances and they placed it on his finger together. The new Uzumaki legacy had begun. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.